All right, we're going to get next onto our next talk with how to doom a crypto wallet by Evelyn Cronin, a security engineer at Cat Labs, a tech startup building tools to fight crypto crime, pen tester who lives and breathes cybersecurity. Finished in the top 3% in National Cyber League CTF with over 6,000 comp uh, competitors. Kennesaw State University graduate with a BS in Information Technology and founder of the Information Systems Security Association at KSU with over 300 members. So everyone, please, let's welcome. Woo! as we're about to see here in a second, there are a lot of really important issues concerning cyber um, cryptocurrency that require really serious conversation. And um, we need some reasonable solutions. The arrest of SBF and what that means for cryptocurrency as a whole. What is and is not a security and who, does, who deserves to make the laws about it? KYC, how far it can go? Lack of regulatory frameworks? the effects of crypto mining on the environment, and guess what? Today, we are going to talk about absolutely nothing of that. No, that's boring. <laughs> we ain't doing that. Um, you're here because today, we are going to be talking about the Trezor crypto wallets. Today, we will be covering what hardware cryptocurrency wallets are and what they can do for you. What options are out there? A comparison of Trezor models, focusing on the Trezor for a reason, an introduction to Trezor modding and its various applications, the tools available for modding your Trezor, and finally, we will answer the most important question of all, but um, we'll get to that question here in a bit. So, uh, short comparison. Hardware crypto wallets are physical devices that store the private key to your various cryptocurrency wallets. This key, you may know as a seed, the seed is derived from said private key, Either way, it's bad if that would fall into hands that are not yours. This stores the private key offline with rare exceptions. The new Ledger wallet that has not come out yet is actually online capable. So far, that is the only exception I know of on the market. The physical device is used to verify the transactions made, making it pretty hard that even if someone were to have a backdoor to fake a verified transaction. And it varies in price starting as low as around $69 hey, dollars. Um, <laughs> thank you. So uh, software crypto wallets are programs that store this private key. The problem is most of y'all have internet on your computers. So it's storing this key online and naturally hackers are going to hack. So that's not necessarily the most secure thing in the world. In addition, the software is used instead of hardware to verify the transactions made. And it starts at the low, low price of free. Just um, remember, if you're not paying for something, you're probably the product. Finally, these can be custodial or non-custodial. Basically what that means is custodial means you have a third party. So, yo, bro, yeah, I lost my seed. Can you get me my seed back? Yeah, sure, bro, whatever. <laughs> Hopefully you trust that third party, because that would be a custodial wallet. Non-custodial means you are in charge which is great for security. It's bad if you're really forgetful. <laughs> so, yeah, pick your fave. Um, hardware crypto wallets are naturally considered to be the safer options. Of course, storing a key offline is generally going to be more secure than storing it online with all the hackers in this room. No offense, guys, I wouldn't trust any of y'all with my private key. Um, <laughs> The chance of obtaining a pre-compromised hardware wallet, if you know what to look for, if your mail's not being intercepted and you're not one of those weird fringe cases, is incredibly low. The likelihood of installing a software wallet onto a pre-compromised device, particularly seeing most of these wallets are designed for mobile devices, given almost everyone uses TikTok, is pretty darn high. Um, in addition, having the physical hardware wallet can require to confirm transactions makes it a little bit harder to fake. Hardware crypto wallets are designed with security in mind, being not a sales pitch. This is literally their business model. Those free wallets may not be designed with your best interest, particularly if they're free. Who is the product? Where are they making their money? Finally, hardware wallets have tamper evident warnings. We will get to that in a minute because we are going to have to bypass these somehow. Software wallets may not. I, I think I've seen one that does. Um, and there's a few hundred options. So, there are two major players in the crypto wallet world right now, Ledger and Trezor. 
Ledgers are proprietary. They are also more expensive, but they're considered more secure as less exploits have been found for them. However, like I said, they're proprietary. The other option is an open source option. This open source option naturally has more exploits being found for it. That may or may not be due to its open source nature. One thing to keep in mind here. They are also more cost effective and open to a much wider audience. Um, in fact, we are going to be covering that wider audience here in a second as well. Development is also much easier with open source platforms, so we are going to be focusing on the open source options today because I do not feel like doing that much reverse engineering. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so there are three models of uh, Trezor wallets available. The Model T, woo, shiny. It's, a, it's the touchscreen one, full color, looks nice. $219 being one of the more expensive options on the market. It does not have any additional coins it supports. It does not do anything additional compared to the other options it just has a touch screen. It's nicer. It's shiny, all right? Um, but the $69 option there in the middle, the Model 1, eh, will uh, do you just fine. Finally, this guy. This one's weird. We'll get back to him in a second. He is pre-order only, and he comes in pink for you <laughs> Barbenheimer types. Um, it's very important he comes in pink, I'm sure. I'm, I bet eventually it stores crypto better. But um, all joking aside, <laughs> I have a little bit of a sneak peek for you tonight of this one. So what option's best for Trezor modding and why do we even care? In reality, most users will never actually need to modify their Trezor in any way. It supports 8,000 coins already. I mean, what are you really gonna invest in? Um, but there are some occasions where it comes in handy. One, if you want to know the code you are running. The code is available. You can audit it yourself. That's pretty cool. Um, you can also add additional coins in case you're one of those people that really like the fringe coins. Of course, if you live in a nation that's really crypto aggressive and you don't want any idea on file that you have crypto, you can just make your own wallet. It's open source. Have at it. And finally, the most important reason, memes. <laughs> so, creating your own treasure. Trezor being open source, it has its stuff available to the public, schematics, all of that. That's part of why more exploits have been written for it over the ledger. So given that you can, you know, source the parts yourself, nothing's stopping you, you can assemble your own. You can flash the hardware. The hardware is publicly available, signed, ready to go. Nothing's stopping you from going on their GitHub, compiling it yourself, which we will do today, actually. Um, and there's two big reasons to consider doing this. One, it's fun. It's actually a really cool project and we'll push your soldering skills to the limits. We'll teach you how to source particularly uh, finicky to find parts. And it's also really nice to know what you are putting your investment on. If you don't trust the tech that you buy from the store, this may be the project for you. However, there's a second reason. If you do not want it on any record that you have any traces of cryptocurrency anywhere near you, this is the project for you. If you are, say, in a crypto adverse nation, or if for some odd reason you don't want it on file that you ever ordered a cryptocurrency device, you don't want your credit card company or bank to know, sourcing this stuff, because these parts are so generic, is actually pretty stealthy. So that opens up a little bit of possibility there in case. <clears throat> One, even if you don't get the exact same hardware, there's plenty of variations. One I have listed here is the Pi Trezor. Turn a Pi into a Trezor. No one's gonna look at you weird for buying a Pi. They, they might actually wonder where you got it, honestly. That is things <coughs> are made of unobtainium, but you know, another time. Um, so, one of the biggest reasons is to add a non-supported coin to pre-existing Trezor firmware. These devs are already overloaded with hundreds of coin requests. Everyone has a coin these days and they want it added to Trezor. Okay, cool. But you can speed this up yourself by actually forking the repo, adding the coin support, and then getting it approved by the official Trezor team. Like, as it says, there's over 8K coins supported. Chances are, what you want to invest in is going to be supported. But in case you have some weird fartoshi somewhere in your wallet, um, 
In order to facilitate quick additions of your own custom butt coin, um, <laughs> you can fork the repo and add it yourself. The most common and most famous case of this is with Dark Coin. Dark Coin and Trezor, they battled for a while. Um, however, this could be used for the more mischievous among us. Because it is an unsigned firmware, it will warn you when you boot it. And this is why I said tamper evident warnings. It will warn you when you boot the firmware. It will warn you when you plug it to the computer. This is an unsigned firmware. Do you wish to continue? If you select yes, Trezor is by no means irresponsible for you selecting yes. That's on you now. And say I'm from whatever, you know, crypto community, I could make a backdoored firmware. You can, and it would be nasty. And if it's, you know, using the cover stories of say, a coin that's unsupported at this time, it could get nasty. It would be quite an interesting phishing technique, one that, although may have not been seen in the wild quite yet, could trick an unassuming crypto investor to, you know, throw caution to the wind in order to get their coin supported. Um, so a quick firmware comparison. We're going to need this because we are going to have to deal with two different firmwares. That's right, the Model 1 is still on the legacy firmware. The legacy firmware they have been trying to add to the Model Repo for years now. I'm waiting. Um, the, the Model T uses the core firmware. These are completely different. MicroPython, C. And what about this guy? We'll get to him in a minute. He's just weird. Um, <laughs> we will cover that in a second. So, remember the third guy is not open to the public yet. He is still on here for a reason, getting to that. So you kind of need to know what firmware you're dealing with to know what you want to do. The legacy, not that great for memes. Um, it only has two colors. It is slowly being phased out by the Trezor Core. And in fact, the entire wallet may be phased out here shortly. Speculation, of course. The core firmware is the modern one. It's the one that they want to encompass all Trezor products, which is great, until it's not. Um, both, of these, both of these firmwares have their quirks. And I will be showing you that when we get to the actual code section of this. Um, to note, currently, officially, legacy only runs on the one and core only runs on the T. However, we are going to push the bounds of official tonight because I do not care what they say. We're going to get some extra functionality out of core. So let's see how to get started. If you're wondering why my computer is running the oldest version of Ubuntu ever, this is why. It gives the most consistent results I've noticed with the dev environment. So you're going to need a pretty beefy computer, that or a lot of patience. Um, 20.2, one for Ubuntu, is giving me the most consistent results. You could also use 20.04. I would not recommend using anything else. Um, I ran into consistent dependency issues, but enough effort and you could make this run on darn near anything. Um, you're going to want Nix. I know, I know, Nix shell, yep. Um, it's way more consistent than using their Docker. I had nothing but issues with their Docker image. You're going to want Python because even if you are using this for legacy, which is written in C, they still use a poetry environment for a reason, I'm sure. Um, and that poetry environment is going to require Python. And finally, Git, because this ain't my code. We got to get it from somewhere. Kada. <laughs> um, <laughs> So for the fun stuff, yay! I'm going to show you a little bit about the tre uh, Trezor Legacy. I got my notes up here. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit here. Let me move this out of the main screen. Oh my god, I forgot how much I hate this. Um, <laughs> I'm a Fedora user, let's make this more clear. Um, okay. I'm not used to this at all, oh my god. Ubuntu GNOME is just, ugh. Um, anyways, so we are currently at home, and I have this in Trezor firmware. When you open it up, it's going to look a bit like this. What's important right here is the shell.nix. 
This is your Nix OS environment already basically written down with your requirements and stuff. Um, keep, this is our saving grace so that we don't have to use that stupid Docker image. I forgot the bleh. <laughs> do, 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 do. Let's try this again. Now it's going to hang here a second, being why I said a somewhat beefy laptop. If these wait times are closer to 30 minutes on um, most of my systems. So your mileage may vary on how long this takes. Um, normally you'd have to do poetry install here in order to install the poetry environment. Good news is we've already done that because that part takes forever. Poetry Shell. All right, so now we are running Nick Shell with Poetry Shell on the inside. I know, I know, don't look at me like that. Um, <laughs> but um, the firmware to build, we're going to go into Legacy, because as I said, Legacy is kind of its own thing. It's different from Core. And the commands are dot slash script. So there is a script in there. And then it's going to be uh, set up so that we can clean out any old build remnants. Pretty fast, right? Yeah, no, it's a lot slower than that on several other systems, including the other one in my bag. Um, and then you're going to go see my build. Do, 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 do. Looks pretty cool. Now you get all the hacker typer um, without even having to require internet access. Um, you see a lot of files going there, but the one that we are particularly interested in for custom firmware development would be the C, the Trezor.C, which I have a custom Trezor.C here to show you tonight, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, while this is compiling, any questions? Your Nix, um, is that uh, the lady online that does her own Linux, Nix OS? Uh, mm -hmm. Nix OS, yeah. That, that's our community. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep, that's NixOS. Um, for the build script for NixOS, all you have to do is uh, go to the website and pull the build script. I personally use the uh, multi-user install. Um, even though this is a single-user laptop, I have ran into issues without using the multi-user install when it comes to pseudo permissions. So I would recommend using multi-user for consistency. That is unless you have you know, users you don't really trust on your laptop. I wouldn't recommend that myself, but you know, teach their own. So this is located in firmware, and then we have Trezor. Oh, really? Good news is I've already compiled this ahead of time because sometimes this thing happens. So, the, oh, don't worry, I, I've still got the firmware. We don't get to walk on so far. Oh, we will. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes it gives me a little bit of trouble. Um, this is the problem of having four demos in a single talk. We're actually going to just try to reinstall Poetry. Oh, yeah, Internet Access. Got to get that real quick. <laughs> Let me connect to the Internet real quick, and we will get to that. Any questions while I'm connecting? Come on. So the reason why the poetry install requires internet and the rest of it does not is poetry is basically Python requirements list more or less for this particular purpose mixed in with a virtual environment. So when you do the poetry install, you're less installing poetry and more installing the dependencies required by the poetry environment. It sounds like Minicom to all of it. It basically is. <laughs> and it's annoying. But now we have internet. I'm just going to go ahead and run through that again and see if that's what's... Oh, it looks like that is actually fine. Really? Okay, it just doesn't like me today. Oops. Oh, well, I'll be all right. Give me a second, and I will get that running. Copy that over here. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. Why it's giving me this? It's giving me that same error again. Huh. Curious. Uh, I am within the environment. All right. 
The good news is we have internet, so now I can attempt to recompile. My apologies for the delays. So, if you want the emulator, say you don't have the physical hardware and you're looking to get a build of this before buying the physical hardware, or if this is just a curiosity to you and you don't want to spend money, don't forget to export emulator one, which will be required for the emulator and not the flashable firmware. If you use zero, you will get the flashable firmware that actually goes on said hardware, which you may or may not. Uh, no, I compiled this ahead of time, so it shouldn't be giving me that error. Um, this was done last night, but we are going to go ahead and do it live because uh, demos happen. <laughs> Good question, though. Thank you. So don't forget to always run setup, always, every time. You don't want um, building, um, you don't want build sticking around and uh, messing up your next build. Especially in this, because I've noticed it does this to me quite a lot. You'll get um, build artifacts from the last run that will stick and uh, throw this off, and then you're wondering what the error is on line 141 of God knows what file. It's literally yeah, make it under like the hood. Um, this is the file. Uh, this, well, this is the script that is given to you by the Trezor uh, GitHub. Yeah, it's make under the hood. You technically don't have to use this. I'm doing so for the purpose of teaching in case someone is not experienced enough in make to make this work themselves, so to speak. But uh, looks like it is showing up today. There we go. So you see this little thing, right? Yeah. Yes. So is that actually emulating the wall? Yes, itself? it is. And. Now I can actually show you what a custom firmware looks like. So this is the base firmware. Uh, as you see, it's two color, no grayscale, itty bitty little thing. Um, this isn't that good for memes, let's be honest. Nah, you can't really see meme quality on here, but it's fine. <laughs> Exiting out of this, if you want to make your own, you're going to go into here and that's going to be Trezor firmware, and we are focusing on legacy right now. I will get to core and the other one in a second. And you'll go into legacy, and then we're gonna go into firmware, which is right here. Wow, it's hard to do this backwards. Um, and you are going to look for Trezor.c. Yeah, thank you. And you're going to get something that looks like this. Lots of include statements in there. <laughs> but what you're interested in is the entrance for this program is in main. So we're going to go all the way down here, basically. Up a bit. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I cannot see from this distance. <laughs> you cannot tell. Yeah, it's not main. So, setup is important, but you need to disable these stack guards. They will cause you nothing but grief if you're trying to emulate. You will have a bad time if you forget these, because there are pain in the butt. Um, then you're going to want this statement left. Rest of it, down to the end of main, you can comment out and replace with your own meme goodness. As I'm about to show. It's in here somewhere. Although I am having some minor difficulties with my pre-compiled uh, pre firmware, sadly. Um, this is what it looks like when it's edited. We're going to go down to main. Again, you see all these comments here? Forgot to mention these. Um, so this stuff is commented out because it will air out on the um, compiling if you do not remove the entropy pieces if you're not going to use them. You may want this in your custom firmware if you are porting a special, say, crypto coin or something, or the entropy is actually going to be required. I'm using mine as a gallery application that only shows one picture and shows it badly. So we do not need it for this. <laughs> so you see all this in here. This is what a BMP file looks like. This is the format required to show one. 
And the reason there's four of them in here is every one of them looked god awful, except for the last one being my company logo. And that's why it's the company logo. Um, if you get down here, you'll see how those are commented out, that the Cat Labs data is still available here. This is what it looks like to call to that. This is all pixel by pixel. Wow. There is a converter online that I wish I knew about, but I know about it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a rough day. <laughs> Meanwhile, you downloaded all the hacks on the planet and just shoved this into a struct. Bingo. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Someone get her a shoehorn because that's just brilliant. Thank you, gentlemen in the hat. I do need a beer. Um, <laughs> so, you see all of this commented out, but you'll recognize that it's identical from the Trezor.c. I do not advocate removing crap because this, the, these libraries are not well documented. And if you remove it, you might do like I did when you just literally wiped out everything and then you're like, oh, why doesn't this work? Yeah, it needs a setup. It needs to call the setup. It doesn't tell you it needs to call the setup. And then you'll be staring at this thing for a week pulling your hair out. I am here to save you guys that time. <laughs> um, you're welcome. So to show the image that I am about to show, it is quite literally, woo, set up. D, R, B, G, initiate. O, L, E, D. Yes, you have to call these separately. <laughs> Don't ask me why. I guess that's why it's legacy. Um, then you draw the bitmap that is up there to it, and then you have to refresh the screen. It will not show until the screen is refreshed. So if you're wondering why your picture does not show, yes. Is it using an SSD 1306? Bingo. Yeah, I've actually written the drivers. Please help me. <laughs> <laughs> and this keeps the emulator from quitting out on you before you get to look at your Mimi goodness. Um, this is normally going to be used for Trezor CTL, which is the command line utility used for debugging Trezors. The most common purpose is to flash your custom hardware to said hardware, but we are going to uh, skip that for today due to time constraints. Um, there's more information about that. It's actually very well documented available in the actual Trezor GitHub. Also, check lock screen. Yeah, that's kind of important. I want to leave that in there. Don't know why it's important. It doesn't call to it at all in this application, but it won't compile without it, so. <laughs> Yay, documentation. So what you do is you take this, and we are going to do something incredibly simple. Take this. There is a Trezor.c right here. We are getting rid of the official Trezor.c. We are going to take that file we just did, put that in there, and rename it to Trezor.c. From there, we can compile. As soon as I get out of Nautilus, I forgot about that, oops. Okay, now we can compile. Actually, let me, Oh, huh, really, okay, screw. There we go. Yay! <laughs> Good times, all right? So from there, once again, clear the build. All right. CI build. I know, right? It's building. It's building. It's building. It's building. It's building. Woo, it's, it's building. C and it's building. <laughs> okay. Um, to emphasize C is exactly the point. It's like, oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, there are a couple of different actually addressing modes for it and how you can uh, address the pixels that you're going to write. Mm -hmm. Really, only one of them I actually got to fucking work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. <laughs> and, just like that, we have custom firmware! <laughs> That is not all. I can't just leave you with legacy now, can I? They're phasing this out. Who wants to write to legacy anyways? We have more presentation and more demos. It's not over yet. So, let me get you down to it. Start from current slide. There we go. So, I showed you the custom firmware. I showed you uh, legacy. Now we're going to go to core. 
and then we are going to go to that really weird Vault 3 thing. Um, I'll get to why it's important in a second. So for this, we are going to go back out to the main Trezor firmware directory. Let me pull up the text editor as that has a little bit of my notes. All right, so to compile core, it's actually a lot easier. Mainly because it's MicroPython and has given me a lot less garbage. Still gonna give you garbage though, sorry. Welcome. Um, <laughs> it's going to be make, build, Unix. Do, 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 do. Now, remember this, there was that Trezor Model T in there, for those of you who saw very quickly. This, the Vault 3 is an R. That is right. It is not available to the public yet, but the firmware is in the repo, and I have compiled that to show you guys tonight. What? Are these running on microcontrollers or microprocessors? I believe microprocessors. Uh, um, is it like an STM series? I think so. I need to double check on that though. Um, please get with me after the talk and I'm more than happy to go through that with you. All right. So we have this here. Cool. And to run it, it's actually a Python script. Uh, this script is going to take a second to uh, do the thing with the stuff. So uh, give it a minute. Download more internet. There we go. So, this is a much nicer emulator of running the Trezor Model T standard core. This is what they're all trying to move towards, firmware. However, like I said, we can't just stop that there, can we? So, to compile the Trezor R firmware, this took me a minute. I had to read through several help questions. Uh, this was a pretty hidden flag, all things considered. I couldn't find anyone who had found this and actually attempted to run it in an emulator in its entirety. So to my knowledge, this is a freak Nick debut of Trezor firmware that doesn't even exist yet. Ooh. This is available, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> give me those. So, this was the $79 wallet, the pink one. The one that is rumored to be replacing the Model 1. I believe it would be. The Model 1, the core firmware for the Model 1 has been in development for some time now. And there hasn't been much movement to forcing it over to core. However, all of a sudden this new wallet swoops in and now it's available for pre-order and it's identical to the one with having an HSM being the only additional feature. It's $10 at the price point, basically uh, the same interface. I mean, I'm pretty sure. Speculation is there, I do not work for Trezor. But I am pretty sure that the new Vault 3 will be replacing the Trezor 1, to my knowledge. Which would explain why there is no prototype build for Trezor 1 within the core firmware. However, the Trezor R, there is one. And today, I am going to show it. So, just change it over to Trezor underscore model all caps equals 1. And then, I mean R, yes. And then make build Unix spell it correctly. And if you look, Trezor model R, that was taken as a valid argument. Interesting, huh? Now, this will only run for a few seconds before it airs out. And the reason why is the pin implementation that is required for the, the Vault 3, that is optional on other Trezors, has not been fully implemented yet. So it is going to call to a function that does not yet exist, and that will fail the whole thing in. So we're only going to get a few seconds of runtime here. This is why it's still in pre-order and why it's not available to the public. But it will be enough to uh, show you guys a few of the differences. So mu.py, and we're going to have move this over real quick. You see how fast that compiled? System exit, and fail through. Yeah, trust me, I wouldn't want to show this off either. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have under request underscore pin dot pi, verify user pin. This is all um, in current help documents. You can actually read the developers arguing a little bit up on the public GitHub. Please make your GitHub comments worth it, guys. Because <laughs> people like me have to read them, okay? <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> all right. So, going back to said presentation, 
Let's wrap this up a little bit with. Now, what was that question I asked at the beginning? The most important question, the one I've basically left you on a clip to hanger for, right? Will it run doom? Will it run doom? Yes! Somebody got the title of this presentation. I didn't mean doom as in crypto is doomed. Crypto is far from doomed and will likely be around for a lot longer, even with the government re uh, regulations coming in. Even with everything that's happening, it's hard to kill an idea. And even if cryptocurrency may not exist in the current form, it will continue to exist in other formats. You can't kill thought. But what you can kill is some nasty firmware, which I attempted to write. <laughs> so, with that, does it run doom? <laughs> I put all my effort in that one slide, guys. <laughs> The answer, it, it's still in development. Oh. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but if you want more information about this project and me committing a sin against Doom with the single worst port ever known <laughs> to Doom, <laughs> yes. Uh, you should actually look into the code of back when we were still using MP3 players, there was a firmware called Rockbox. Okay. And it came, came bundled with a copy of FreeDoom. So I remember actually mm. flying out of SSD 1306 uh, on a Samsung Flip. I'll take a look at that. So if you actually use that code from Rockbox, you should have a much easier time. This man is trying to get you to copy and paste it and just do it easy. Yeah, <laughs> please help me do it easy. I was trying to do this frame by frame, pixel by pixel. Download, download more internet. Use yeah, download more internet. There's already, there's, already, uh, there's already a port of it in Rockbox uh, for uh, getting the Doom mods to run on very small systems like that. So. Perfect, thank you. I will look into that. So this is still in development. If you guys are at all interested in the history of the worst Doom port ever, <laughs> minus the birth, con the um, you know, baby sticky, uh, are you pregnant? Oh, pregnancy yes. test one, yes, pregnancy. which has to be a little <laughs> less playable due to screen size. Uh, let me know. Um, and thank you all, Freaknik. <laughs> <laughs>